morning and welcome to the, to the session on, on the commons, a part of this year's uh, Workers and Banks University uh, May Day School. Uh, thanks for showing up uh, so early on a Sunday morning. Um, so we, all, we have already uh, began discussing uh, the concept of the commons yesterday. Uh, there were some uh, reservations expressed and I would like to uh, for us to continue in this uh, critical, uh, reflexive spirit. So, in this introduction, I will just note um, why I thought it was uh, why I thought it was necessary uh, to to in include the panel of commons in, into the program of the school. Uh, the first reason is, of course, obvious. It is hard to speak about uh, primitive accumulation for five days without uh, mentioning without mentioning the commons. Um, since enclosure of the commons was the, the, perhaps the most characteristic or emblematic of the processes or is the first association when one thinks at least about the historical uh, process of, of primitive uh, accumulation. Uh, but the second reason and more important is that uh, commons uh, have become recently um, quite problematic. They're not, uh, they're not uh, they're not entirely unproblematic concepts, so there are, there are many different interpretations and one that is especially, let's say, ambivalent is the one that was, that was characterized by George Cafensis in one of his uh, texts as uh, post-neoliberal post um, or post-Washington uh, consensus definition of the commons. So if the commons were appropriated in the early 90s by the anti-capitalist and anti-globalization movement, also, the forces or institutions like the World Bank um, uh, started to appropriate the concept from themselves and tried to give them, with a lot of academic and institutional and monetary support, tried to give it, a, uh, if not necessarily pro-capitalist, but at least a spin in its meaning that is not harmful to capitalists. And this, this type of, this second definition of the commons uh, quickly took off and spread all over the NGO and civil society uh, scene and ecological movement. So there is, uh, there seems to be quite some uh, confusion uh, regarding the commons. Um, and I think it's very important to, to try to draw this concept back into, the, its, uh, into Marxist uh, theoretical uh, uh, um, problematic. Uh, so uh, we have we have three speakers with us uh, today. Uh, the first is uh, Tommy, Tommy Slamedak uh, from Zagreb on my left, and they are also I will introduce them, and they are sitting in order uh, in which they will be speaking. Uh, Tommy Slav is a member of Mu uh, Multimedia Institute Mama uh, from Zagreb, also a free software and uh, free culture advocate, uh, militant of the Right to the City initiative and uh, a member of the theater uh, collective Bad, Bad Company. Um, next is uh, Jerne Amon Protnik. Uh, he's a fellow, fellow researcher at the Social Communication Research Center, uh, teaching assistant at the Media Studies Department, both on the Faculty of Social Sciences, uh, which is part of the University of Ljubljana. And uh, to my far left, Eric Swingedau, uh, professor of Geography uh, on School of Environment and Development at uh, Manchester, Manchester University. Um, so uh, I will, I will, uh, I will pass, um, pass the word now to our first speaker, Tommy Slameda. Uh, he, will, he will talk about um, how, how, how his discussion on the commons are, uh, being contaminated, so to speak, in, uh, with uh, ec economics uh, ideology and what are perspectives for uh, struggles and autonomy uh, regarding digital commons. So, um, do I need to pull the microphone closer? Thank you very much. So, uh, in advance, um, I apologize. I'm not, I'm not a researcher, so I guess my uh, contribution will be somewhat under-theorized for uh, this context. It's more of a, a case study, but um, hopefully provide some uh, food for thought. Um, I'll be speaking quite quickly, so interrupt me if I'm too quick. In this talk, I want to reflect on some of the issues around digital commons, primarily free software, from a historical point of view. 
I'll be looking back at the processes that have shaped the production and access to digital commons and conceptualizations that were produced in order to understand their social significance. Concretely, I will, fo I will focus on three aspects of the problematic. First, economics of digital commons. Second, continuous primitive accumulation by means of intellectual property rights. And third, possibility, possibility of relative autonomy of cooperative production within uh, the existing capitalist mode of production. While analyzing the first and the second, I will talk more in detail about issues that are rel related directly to free software. However, the debate around the digital commons viewed in the historic context of their emergence over the last 20 or 30 years warrants that the logic of digital commons be expanded to include very broad forms of intellectual production, including information, knowledge, culture, and science. That is, forms of intellectual product that are either originally created in the digital form or digitized, and that are then in turn subject to protections or subject to future expansion of protections under copyright, patent, or similar intellectual property rights. But before I say something more about the digital commons, let me make three remarks that frame the discussion of digital commons in a broader perspective of technological development and enclosures. First, when debating the digital commons um, and their enclosures from a historical point of view, we cannot leave material resources out of the debate, simply because the enclosures in digital commons have, over the last 20 years, uh, gone hand in hand with the enclosures of some of the fundamental material resources for human livelihood, such as healthcare or medicines, food production, environmental engineering, all domains where new enclosures have been made possible by the advances in digital technologies. By the late 1990s, um, an offensive was launched, occasioned by the rise of file sharing networks and the push to control the copyright in the digital domain, that served as a pretext and an occasion to solidify protections over tangible resources, such as medicines or, or crops. These overlapping conflicts over tangible and intangible resources then pro prompted allied efforts of free software, open access in scientific publishing, open education, access to knowledge, access to medicine, and open science proponents to push back this global offensive. Secondly, and this gets frequently overlooked by the digital commons advocates such as myself, uh, is the rise of is the fact that the rise of digital technologies, while being emancipatory in many ways, has also implied the technological advances in productivity that have had disruptive effect on society and labor. Some of these contradictions uh, between emancipatory and disruptive features of technologies and digital commons are currently made evident by the debate around massive open online courses, where open access to education plays into the hands of university administrators in their effort in de-skilling and downsizing their faculties. Thirdly, there is a new dimension to the debate in free software. And so far as computing, software and hardware is increasingly transitioning into virtualization and cloud computing, transforming software from a good into a service, where then technology behind the service remains completely out of users reach and control. So while a service might be free of charge, actual economic power, think of for instance Google Docs, actual economic power and control is concentrated in the infrastructure held closed by the service provider, e.g. in big data centers and data sets. And the ability of these providers to process this user-generated data so as to sell users as commodity to advertisers. Thus, struggle over data and not over software is becoming increasingly important in this debate. But let us now turn to digital commons and the story of free software. The debate around economic aspects of digital commons, in particular free software, has been dominated by two very di dis different arguments. The first has come very early on in the history of free software. It acknowledged the innovative character of cooperative form of production in the free software, <coughs> attributing it a revolutionary potential as a post-capitalist form of production. 
This argument was first theoretically put forward, articulated within the context of Ökonomics research group in Germany in the late 1990s and early noughts, primarily by Stefan Merten, Stefan Meretz, and Andrei Gotz. Um, in their analysis, they understood free software as providing means of self-realization or self-fulfillment for creators as being non-commodified and abundant and as providing a seed form of a new formation of cooperative production that would eventually lead into the post-capitalist new GPL society, new GPL general public license of the free software. Um, this line of argument was refuted uh, by Sabine Nuss uh, and Michael Heinrich within the same context in 2001, where they have uh, systematically argued that the, free, that the software, the free software, is not disruptive to capitalist valorization that it can be freely appropriated by the capitalist enterprise as a free input, that it doesn't create the means of subsistence for its creators outside of the capitalist mode of production, and that it can ultimately serve to propel and modernize the capitalist mode of production. But it is the second argument, which has emerged a bit later, that has dominated the debate since. It has reflected the shifting terms of the debate that have come with the mainstream adoption of free software in business, but also with the rise of other propertyless forms of cooperative production, such as exemplified by Wikipedia or open access publishing in science. Um, this second argument was penned in 2002 by Jochai Benkler uh, in his Causes Penguin or Linux and the Nature of the Firm. There he argues that the free software crystallizes a model of, that's his uh, concept, common space peer production, a third organizational model of economic production along the, alongside the firm and the market. Bengler here draws obviously on Ronald Coase's analysis in the nature of the firm, where Coase identifies two fundamental organizational models of economic production in capitalism, the market and the firm, and explains uh, what is the economic rationality for the hierarchical and relatively static organizational form of the firm, something that has puzzled the economists before him. In Coase's view, the firm emerges for reasons of lowering transaction costs, that is, costs in finding and contracting skills and resources necessary in the production of a complex product. Benkler then argues that common space peer production is an emerging organizational form uh, in the production of information exhibits two salient characteristics. Just as the firm it reduces the transaction cost, just as the market it is non-hierarchical. And at that it comes without exclusions of property and separation of producers from the means of production. Ultimately, in the domains of production, where both input and output are information, where the intangible nature of the product may, makes it non-rivalrous and non-excludable, it is superior to both the firm and the market. By operating at the level of institutional micro microeconomics, Bengler's analysis provides probably a better account of the actual economic organizational potential behind the free software than the utopian account of Econox Group. Although an analysis today would probably show that for a while the development model for free software has been a hybrid of peer producers, firms and freelance skills contracted in the market, with the increasing contributions in code made by the large enterprises such as Google or IBM's of this world, who use GNU Linux to power their distributed computing infrastructures. But regardless of that, by formulating the debate around the political economy of digital com commons solely in those terms, ignoring the macroeconomic level and the issues of capitalist mode of production, this analysis condemns the understanding of free software and digital commons to typical obsessions of economics with efficient markets, transaction costs, and price signals. It probably comes as no surprise that a field studying information should conflate and reduce the subject of its study, that is, information economy, with a dominant orientation in economic science, information economics. Such a focus has then led the arguments that have uncritically espoused Bengler's analysis 
to take for granted the assumptions of information economics, including its agnosticism towards limits, limits to growth and the avail availability of resources. This has in, return, uh, in turn resulted in a blind spot where the debate has ignored the issues of cost of reproduction of labor that goes into the production of commons. However, the fact that this theory and its microeconomic approach have become dominant, uh, the fact that this theory has become dominant uh, is due to, uh, not, not to its explanatory power, but rather because it resonates with the efforts by the business-friendly <coughs> open source community to make the free software amenable to interests of profit making. This ideological shift operated by the open source community reflected, however, the actual inability of free software philosophy to articulate and address the problems of how to sustain the labor that goes into the co co cooperative, propertyless form of production that it adv advocates. So let us turn to uh, the issue of primitive accumulation uh, by means of, of uh, intellectual property rights. Well, copyright and patent regulation has started to become internationally standardized at the end of the 19th century. It is only since the enactment of 1994 a trade-related intellectual property rights agreement within the WTO uh, framework that there has been a coordinated push by a small number of developed nations who are, by the way, next exporters of intellectual property rights to impose the harmonization and enforcement of copyright patents and un other intellectual property rights on other nations. As it was enacted at the height of global AIDS crisis, TRIPS agreement very soon showed its teeth when South Africa pressed forward and issued a legal and legitimate compulsory license on AIDS treatment at a moment when over 10% of its population was infected. Only to be immediately sued by 39 international pharmaceuticals who were selling AIDS treatment at the hundredfold price of what the medicine actually cost South Africa to produce and way above the price that an overwhelming majority of South African population could afford. This conflict set off several rounds of international agreements, the latest being ACTA in last year, uh, where uh, developed and underdeveloped nations have fought around the terms uh, and the human cost of international harmonization of intellectual property rights. These agreements have thrown together under the same regime of regulation and bargaining very different social goods, ranging from literature to handbags to medicines to software. Why are they thrown together it becomes clear once we understand that the expansion of intellectual property rights over medicines, knowledge and culture, and the drive towards international harmonization of legal regulation and imposition of strict IPRs on less developed parts of the world, are a telltale example of how expanding circuits of property entitlements, commodification and legal regulation serve to establish markets first as a mechanism of dispossession and discipline and only later as an economic mechanism. This strategy of prospecting and its disciplining can be well exemplified if we look at the case of proprietary software, take for instance Microsoft uh, Windows as an operating system, where piracy as one of the primary targets of global IPR policing has been at the same time tolerated by copyright holders as a strategy to establish a de facto monopoly in operating system, system standards and applications across the globe, including the countries where the weak to non-existent purchasing power of local markets does not justify the need for such regulation and expansion, and hence to establish forms of global market concentration that help them make a killing in profits where and when their products can be monetized. These new enclosures operated from the capitalist centers across the global space and exploiting the difference in the economic power uh, between countries and social strata exhibit a double complementary character that Midnight Notes Collective has written about already in the 1990s. The exclusion from the means of production and the creating of new property relations on the periphery is always complementary to the commodification and marketization targeting the working class in the center. 
As said in the beginning, the wholesale character of international regulation of intellectual property rights meant that the emerging debate over the protection of copyrightable works in the, in the digital domain provided a pretext or an occasion to solidify also the protections over material resources needed for subsistence and the exclusion of broad parts of the world from the advances in knowledge, technology, medicines, and so on. Because the international IPR treaties cut, deep, cut deeply into the issues of livelihoods of populations and of competition between national economies in the global marketplace, most of whom are in the position of IPR dependency, they have mobilized primarily popular leftist governments of the global south and the scientists, experts and activists working on these issues of access to food, medicine, knowledge and culture to resist these treaties. And this is the conflict that still rages on, uh, as we have recently witnessed with the efforts of the most advanced capitalist economies to avoid multi multilateral or multilateral forums such as WTO or WIPO, uh, where their deals have failed to produce desired outcomes and impose protections by means of bilateral deals with which they are, for now, unsuccessfully trying to break the alliances that have resisted their enforcement efforts so far. Let me now turn to free software with a question, what would be a relative autonomy of a sphere of cooperative <coughs> production without exclusive property operating under the continuous condition of real existing capitalism? Or rather, could such autonomy exist at all? It obtains more than ever before that the free software is far from becoming a disruptive force in the development of capitalism and technology. Both because its model has become seamlessly integrated into the business model of large capitalist enterprises and because the development of information technology has made the idea of software as a package and reproduced good protected by copyright less relevant. Yet still, when considered in the historic context of its emergence, it can provide us with some understanding of what an attempt at designing a project of autonomy in the capitalist world might be and understanding where the free software itself as a project of creating autonomy has failed. If we return to Richard Stallman's own account of the emergence of the new project in the early 1980s, we are met with a story that is precisely an account of primitive accumulation by separations, separation of workers from their means of production. In that period, the IT companies have started to understand that the software could be commodified as well and sold as a separate product from the hardware it was previously shipped with for free. But in order to achieve that, the, the code had to be closed off and the software programmers working collaboratively on code, most of whom, most of whom have worked at research labs and ac academic institutions, had to be excluded from access. By starting the new project and drafting the new general public license, a legal document that uses the copyright regulation in order to turn it on its head, Stolman had designed a process that was aimed at preventing expropriation and commodification, maximizing use value, creating cooperative access to means of production, and allowing members of the society to have some control over the software running many of the contemporary social processes. Where free software has failed, obviously, is that in the clash with the capacity of market forces to transform and integrate adverse projects, and more importantly, in the failure to account for the substance of programs developing, the programmers developing software. There are significant and significant limitations to the modifications, to the, sorry, let me start this again, and I'm finishing this. There is significance and significant limitations to the commodified spheres of production in the capitalist system. Given the amenability of common space peer production to capitalist valorization processes, the fact that they can easily be integrated as externalities, complements or free inputs into the commodified production process, their anti-systemic, disruptive and transformative potential remains limited. However, in a capitalist society, they still achieve a level of independence from money and effectively constitute an autonomous sphere of collective production. In order for these forms of cooperative production to survive, we need to find a way to embed them and grow them in a broader system of cooperative production and to grow them as a complement to public services instead of surrendering them to free-riding markets. Thank you. Thank you.
was spontaneous, just so you know, you didn't have a grip beforehand, but the applause. Um, I'm, I'm now passing the word to Jene Amon Prudnik, uh, who will talk about the commodification of the uh, wider communication sphere. Um, yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, I'll actually start from the, the, the opposite side. So, as Primo said, uh, from the standpoint of commodification and I should turn it on. Okay. Is this okay? You now I can hear myself echoing in the distance and I'm a little nervous, but I hope everything will be fine. <laughs> Joking, sorry. Um, so, uh, as we all know, uh, enclosures, uh, commons, uh, uh, privatization, uh, commodification are concepts that are closely connected to each other. So, I will start uh, from the uh, perspective of commodity form and commodification, uh, especially in the communica communicative uh, field, as uh, Primo said, um, uh, from the Department of Social Communication. And uh, then I'll try to return to the concepts of the commons and so on. So, I will proceed in the following manner. First, I will briefly present some accounts that deal with the intensification of commodification in our daily lives. Uh, these are some popular uh, examples. Uh, these processes, I think, back the question of how this intensification is made possible and what are the reasons that this uh, intensification is occurring. Uh, secondly, I will demonstrate there was, in fact, a very long revolution in the proliferation of communicative, com communicative commodities and information resources as commodities. Uh, thirdly, I will point at the concrete historical, political and political economic uh, causes and processes that uh, significantly, significantly contributed to an increased economic and social role of this type of commodities. And lastly, I will connect the, these changes to the primitive accumulation, uh, to the enclosures of the commons of the mind, so to say. Uh, now, as we all know, uh, and as Emmanuel Wallerstein also pointed out, the history of capitalism has, among other things, also been a history of never-ending global commodification of basically anything. Uh, what seems to be novel in discussions about uh, these processes is the fact that nowadays, uh, these issues connected to the sustained processes of commodification are not limited to the supposedly uh, radical margins of social sciences like they were in the past. Uh, awareness of the ongoing transformations uh, became important also in the popular discourse and in the mainstream academic research. Uh, but the term commodification has in many of these analyses been replaced by euphemisms uh, such as financialization, marketization, monetization, or simply the reading of money. Uh, Randy Martin, for example, talks about the financialization of everyday life, uh, claiming that money has become both the means and the final goal of human lives. Uh, and because finance, financialization broke beyond the corporate world uh, into the uh, basically households, this is forcing people to continuously act uh, and think like capitalists, even though they have no capital, basically. Uh, Martin was by far not alone in his popular observations. A moral philosopher Michael Sandel uh, has recently posited, posited uh, very similar questions in his uh, new bestseller book. Because of the seemingly endless market expansion, he asked in the title of his book, uh, What Money Can't Buy. Uh, now, leaving capitalism to its own uh, expansionary, expansionary logic, it doesn't seem there, there are any limits. And actually, actually Sandel uh, seems to agree with this, uh, uh, even though he finds this uh, very questionable, of course. Uh, he points out that economics is being, becoming an imperial domain because it, is increasing, because it increasingly governs the whole life. And he continues that almost everything can be bought and sold. Markets now govern our lives as never before." Unquote. Uh, what's interesting is the fact that both Martin and Sandel seem to agree that this did not occur by some autonomous uh, decision of factors that completely uh, succumbed under the rule of the market. Uh, these conditions were in fact slowly enforced upon them uh, without any visible coercion or anything like that. They basically completely encroached upon our lives, uh, upon our everyday life activities uh, uh, in a way that uh, 
could hardly be imagined a couple of de decades, decades ago. Uh, now, in the mostly Marxist and some other radical political economic approaches, these processes have fallen under the umbrella of theories that analyze the role of the commodity form and cap in the capitalist societies. Uh, the concept of commodification, contrary to the used euphemisms uh, uh, mentioned earlier, uh, necessarily looks beyond appearances into the structural causes of the existing capitalist relations in the wider society, uh, which also makes, makes it uh, a more com comprehensive concept. Uh, as Marx put it, the commodity form is one of the cell forms of capitalism, and only in capitalism collection of commodities is an ele elementary form of wealth, as uh, Heinrich uh, put it. Uh, now, how does this uh, relate to the so-called information revolution and information society? As we know, historical accounts uh, tracing the emergence of culture, information, and communication as such all relevant parts of capitalist production, production and accumulation, so to say, the material base, and being a part of the relative, uh, relevant uh, commodity chains, uh, they usually extend only as far as to the second half of the 20th century. Well, to be honest, some of them also uh, include Adornos and Horkheimer's uh, culture, industry, country, culture industry, but this is about it. Uh, in this historical period, so in the, part of the, uh, the second part of the 20th century, as the old narrative goes, there was supposedly an occurrence of a radical socio-economic transformation, so to say, a, a clean break. Uh, theories that developed this notion pointed at several mechanisms that uh, contributed to this uh, supposedly radical historical, historical break, uh, but sharply, uh, the sharply increasing social and especially economic importance of the information resources was in all likelihood the most important one uh, that was prescribed by, by these authors. Uh, this was the so-called information revolution which apparently resulted from the new information and communication technologies. Uh, What's interesting, uh, and uh, as we all know, is that this historical period was one of the most spectacular de decades of social conflict and man manipulative uh, control. So, the rise of the new left, uh, student protests, uh, we could also see it in, in the light of uh, decolonization and so on. Um, uh, when, when it comes to, to, to uh, decolonization, for example, uh, <coughs> There, there was new theories that started to uh, show that there are continuing dependencies, of course. So this was a conflictual uh, time. Um, and in this very antagonistic social context, uh, Daniel Bell uh, proclaimed that there was an end of ideology, which is even more incomprehensible if, if we take all these, uh, this whole context into account. Uh, but what today seems plausible is that the primary, and even if it was only um, implicit and unintentional, uh, consequence of these uh, information society theories was to legitimize a relatively comprehensive political economic reorganization, which would provide new social stability in time of uh, political perturbations and looming economic crisis. This was, uh, after all, also a time of an imminent systemic capitalist crisis as the existing, existing accumulation process uh, reached its limits. Uh, these theories basically predicted what was about to happen and uh, it was about to happen because political decision makers implemented it. So it, it wasn't uh, some natural process of uh, how capitalism uh, developed, but it was something that uh, uh, political decision makers actively sought to, to develop. Uh, Still, looking at the surface of things, it still seems that uh, we are confronted with a considerable contradiction. On one hand, we are forced to acknowledge that through the past few decades there indeed was an important reconstruction of the capitalist production and the accumulation. Uh, these changes uh, are in a large part owed to the increasing role played in society by the information resources, communication and knowledge uh, that gained in social and especially economic importance. Uh, Vincent Mosco, uh, already in the 80s, for example, debunked the, the fantasies about a radically different social order uh, that supposedly originated from the new technologies. But at the same time, he also pointed out that information had indeed become uh, vital to corporate capitalist uh, accumulation. 
Uh, however, however, even if we concede there was important uh, changes, uh, uh, the base is still still same, uh, still stayed capitalist, and uh, this is a conclusion that most authors writing in the field of political economy and communication I deal with uh, seem to agree with. Now, one way. One possible way of resolving this apparent contradiction is by turning to dialectics, uh, whose fundamental philosophical function, as Frederick Jameson pointed out, is that it enables us to simultaneously think two phases of history, which otherwise seem ill-equipped uh, to think uh, at the same time. Namely, identity and difference all at once, the way in which a thing can both change and remain at the same, uh, the same can undergo the most astonishing astonishing mutation, mutations and expansions and still constitute the operation of some basic and persistent structure. Now, adopting the materialist pr perspective, I feel that uh, it seems clear that uh, the concept of information revolution must actually be taken very seriously. Uh, and it must furthermore be connected to the increased, uh, so to say, social need for information in the current epoch. Uh, a key characteristic that accompanied uh, these emerging social needs in the last few decades is the fact that they have finally and completely constituted themselves as commodities. Uh, and information that was pre previously not included in the economy, at least not to an extent that it is today, is now uh, completely part of, part of the market. Uh, now, because information has always been a fundamental part of human societies, it is impossible to define the start of the information society. It seems uh, quite ridiculous. Uh, we are, however, able to define different historical epochs in which the wider importance of information in a certain social context has been intensified, both in the sense of the amount of information to which we have access to and in the sense of the change, changes in the information systems that are crucial for the management, organization, transformation, and story, storing of information. Now, the information revolution that we are supposedly, uh, that we have supposedly been witnessing in the last decades uh, should, I feel, only be seen as a long revolution, as Raymond Williams named the long-term processes of social transformations. Uh, this revolution can quite, po quite possibly be traced several centuries ago, or if we're being a little more uh, modest, uh, at least to the second part of the 19th century when the global communications infrastructure was de developed and utilized, mostly owing, owing to, to an emergence of deep, deep globalization. Uh, this means uh, the expansion of the world markets, rise of the multinational companies and financial, financial institutions, intensification of capital flows and global, global commodity exchange and so on. So Karl Marx actually noted some of these tendencies and there were some other authors in the 19th century that saw close connection between communication infrastructure, information communication flows and economic changes. Uh, but the first commercial gathering of the news, if we're talking about information revolution and everything information-wise starts to be commodified, uh, has already happened uh, in the 15th century in Venice. So, uh, and some other Italian cities sta city states already had uh, printing, and printing and publishing uh, that became important types of uh, businesses. So the emergence of news for profit rationale, uh, both historically and spatially, overlapped with the historical rise of capital at least if we follow uh, Aridis and uh, Braudel's historical analysis. Sorry. Uh, so, as pointed out by Dan Schiller, cultural and informational commodification commenced not after, but within, within uh, the acute social struggles marking the transition to capitalism. Uh, these processes were therefore a part and parcel of structural changes and social struggles that accompanied social transformation into capitalism. There were publishing houses in England in the 16th century, for example, but what's more interesting, perhaps, is that the commodity, commodity exchange of books was still uh, considered very vulgar at the time. Uh, also, newspapers of, often seen as a product, product of the commercial middle class in the 18th century, uh, then a full-blown market expansion of the press in England appeared in the 19th century, uh, when also market speculators emerged uh, uh, Basically, writing became fully commodified in the 19th century. Uh, this also led to a transformation of media into cap uh, typical capitalist industries uh, that 
this, this was a process that uh, was cons consolidated at the start of the 20th century. Now, in any case, communication, culture, and information have been produced as commodities centuries ago. Uh, but their role in the overall capitalist production and wider accumulation process was only slowly becoming as infra influential as it is today. Uh, first, at the end of the 19th century, as I already mentioned, and then especially after the Second World War. Now, why is this exactly? Uh, why this seemingly sudden rise of the role of information and communication in the capitalist economy and the existing historical epoch? Why uh, was there some really observable empirical basis about the so, so much talk about uh, information revolution? Now, if we look at the American political economists of communication, these seem to be in a full agreement that key transformations in the field of information technologies and information economies were in fact commenced and actively promoted by political incentives of the USA through the governmental interventions into the markets. Uh, Herbert Schiller, Vincent Moscow, Christopher May, Dan Schiller, I also think the Professor Perlman Perl Perl would agree, uh, all indicate that political interve interventions were in fact the ones that led to what is often labeled, labeled as the information revolution, and especially to the economic proliferation of information and communication as commodities on one hand, and the new information and communication technologies on the other. Uh, I will just skip a little because I'm, uh, I, I have a little time left. Uh, uh, now, these tendencies of American uh, uh, legislators were closely connected first to uh, their tendency to build a new imperial order. So they didn't, they didn't want to directly control uh, different uh, societies and countries, but they wanted to expand the capitalist market to them. So this uh, closely connects to, to other uh, concept that is uh, cultural imperialism and to what David Harvey called the capitalist imperialism. Uh, this produced new inter international dependencies and helped, them to get, uh, helped Americans to gain the status of global hegemon via cultural imperialism. Uh, this was, for example, promoted through the free flow, free flow of information doctrine around the globe, which was, as Herbert Schiller pointed out, undeniably beneficial to the already powerful, which made it a fraudulent uh, construct. Now, the key role of political interventions, especially of the U.S. government, in these import, important social transformations can be recognized in several areas. Uh, for example, in funding research and development in telecommunication, their so-called liberalization, cha changing, changing global trade and in investment regulation to favor services, privatization of formally public and freely accessible information, and strengthening uh, legal rights to private pro property and information. And now the last two areas are closely connected to, to the proliferation of intellectual property rights that were, uh, were already talked about. Uh, now, if we return now back to the process of enclosures, we see that this so-called information revolution, uh, uh, which, was, which, which was mostly which mostly had direct political causes, contributed both to the direct and in, indirect enclosures. Uh, direct enclosures can be seen around the world with the enclosure of what are, in fact, by definition, public goods or even meta-public, as uh, Professor uh, Perlman would say. Because they increase the, their value when they are used and not, uh, they not lose it uh, uh, like other commodities. Um, because intellectual property rights can today cover almost any aspect and sphere of society, this means that basically anything cannot be commodified, in, even the, the most intimate parts of our relations in life. Uh, to again uh, quote uh, Professor Perlman on this issue at length, uh, intellectual property rights have con contributed to one of the most massive redistribution, redistri redistributions of wealth that has ever occur occurred. And this con continues to be an ongoing uh, process of preventing access to the common heritage of human societies. Uh, in closing, the commons of uh, the mind, as David Boyle, Boyle called it, uh, can be seen as uh, the second intensive and important wave of enclosures which in a very similar manner to the earlier enclosures again has extra economic uh, incentives. It includes commodifying knowledge, information, communication resources, uh, just to mention a few. But there was also an indirect role in the enclosures uh, where proliferation of the new technologies and the free flow of information played its role. 
Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, cultural imperialism uh, can be considered as an could be considered and still can be considered as an important weapon in certain in some somehow an overall global Amer American hegemony. This happened especially after the 70s. Now it's obviously uh, waning, but. Uh, there was definitely uh, a desire to emulate the American way beyond the American borders and the, uh, the American regulators tried to implement this through uh, different uh, policies, global policies, so to say. Um, uh, when looking at the rise of intellectual property rights and the total commodification of the community field, it is also worth asking ourselves whether we are witnessing a qualitative transformation in the process of commodification, which would in a large part be owed to an overwhelming capitalist enclosure of commodity and information resources, and to the total mediatization of our lives. As Schiller wrote, we are seeing a total absorption in commercial, commercial translations uh, that, permit, that permits the tightest uh, echelons of the social order and filters down to all levels. Uh, the key reason this seems to be an important quality of transformation is the fact that communication inevitably runs through most uh, social relations and spheres, so it persistently breaks apart any solid boundaries. Uh, this uh, transformation, I think, uh, brought about what could be term, termed the seeping commodification, uh, somehow a uh, historically novel type of commodification which is able to trickle down into the most trivial and seemingly insignificant parts of our lives, but often it directly influences immediate uh, experiences of individuals on the subjective level. Now, as I said, this is mostly because of the overwhelming uh, commodification of communication. Uh, we all know that communication doesn't have such solid boundaries uh, than anything else. So, uh, just to conclude, what I feel uh, is important in critical scholarship is perhaps to put also a little more focus on a, a field of communication, which still seems to be somehow a blind spot of Marxism. Uh, this field of inquiry also has its own ways of operating that cannot be simply converged with the rest of society. After all, it now simultaneously operates both as a part of the material base and as a part of superstructure. Thanks. I'm now passing the word to our last speaker, uh, Eric Sissuida, who will connect the topic of the commons to communism. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I would like to thank the World Vision College University for not only for inviting me, but for organizing this fantastic event. What I'm going to talk about over the next 20 minutes is indeed about the commons. But the commons in association or in articulation with the process of being in common, which is the political process through which we organize access to transformation of and distribution of what we call the commons. And of course, I want to think of the articulation between the commons, both old and new, on the one hand, and the process of egalitarian being in common in the context in the context of what for me is absolutely foundational to any attempt at Marxist analysis, which is that Marxist thought is utterly, utterly useless and impotent if not articulated with, and I quote Marx, if it's not articulated with a real movement that transforms the present order of things. That was his definition of communism, we'll come back to that in a moment. As we've heard already, A, the commons has been a terrain of extraordinary 
dispute over the past 10 years or so. And it is not an inherently progressive, emancipatory, socialist or communist about the commons. It is a contested terrain. As we know, the terrain of the commons has been quite successfully appropriated and mobilized by all manner of reactionary forces, number one. Number two, there's nothing inherently good about the commons. There is this kind of tendency to consider the commons of information, of resources, of gene pools as inherently good. And of course, there are extraordinarily fantastic things that inhere in the commons, but we should not forget that the commons also embodies very often extraordinarily negative destroying tendencies. Think of, for example, the commons of the atmosphere, including the CO2 and methane content, content of the atmosphere, also being a very contested terrain in terms of the commodification of the atmosphere that is taking place at this moment. That is a common stew, and it is at this moment running havoc. Or think of, for example, the commons of waste, electronic waste of my computers, mobile phones, etc., and all other manner of wastes, garbage, shit, is common stew. And there is, of course, an intense yeah, political struggle unfolding over that. Thirdly, I would argue and insist that indeed, in the present historical conjuncture of capitalism, the political struggle over the commons is, at the core of the present, a political struggles and contestations, as was manifested, I would argue, in the magical year 2012, last year, when we saw for the first time in a long historical sequence the re-emergence of what, what you would call a potential proto-communist sequence. I'm referring here, of course, to the proliferation of all manner of democratizing movements ranging from the Arab Spring over the Spanish indignados who demanded real democracy now to the Greek outrage to the Occupy and other movements. What I would argue, particularly in the kind of classic slogan of the Occupy movement, 99% versus one, was precisely evocating, evoking a struggle, political struggle over the commons over the commons. That struggle opens up entirely new rupture points of social and class struggle. It brings up entirely new forms of political subjectivation. And I'm going to quite con controversially argue that if we want to be serious today about a socialist slash communist sequence, we should give up on the three key markers that shaped emancipatory socialist communist struggles in the 19th and 20th century. That is, the party as organization formed, the proletariat as political subject, and the state as the arena over which the struggle unfolds. These three, I would tentatively suggest, have to be ditched, and that's precisely what the political struggle over the commons that has emerged over the past few years brings up. But I do not have the perfect theoretical answer to the alternatives to that. That is our urgent intellectual and political task, I would argue. So, this as a proviso, I'm interested in exploring the communist hypothesis for the 21st century. And at this moment, communism is indeed nothing else than a hypothesis. That also, as a hypothesis, distinguishes radically for, what, for the monster that went under the name of the existing socialism in the 20th century or the regimes that, that, that still go under the name of communism like China, North, uh, North Korea, Nepal, and parts of India. Mm. Thank you. I get the notion of the communist hypothesis, of course, from Alain Badiou, who defined the communist hypothesis as Following. For him, the communist hypothesis is that a different collective organization is practical, practical, one that will eliminate the inequality of wealth and even the division of labor. The private appropriation of massive fortunes and their transmission by inheritance. Inheritance is one of those disavowed political concepts that no one dares to touch, because that's absolutely vital, of course, in any thought of socialism, communism is that the transgenerational transmission of accumulated wealth would not any longer be possible. That would already radically change the dynamics 
of what capitalism is all about. The existence of a coerced state separate from civil society will not long will appear a necessity along a process of reorganization based on a free association of producers will see it withering away. It will become redundant. It's very similar to how Martin Engels defined communism in the German ideology. When he says communism is for us not a state of affairs. It's not a thing. It's a process, a state of affairs which to be established, an ideal to which the reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement that abolishes the present state of things. So as Etienne Bolivar would call it, it is about an eka libertarian being in common that revolves around the management of the commons. Now, a lot of ink has been flown over what the commons is and what constitutes the commons. The two things that are absolutely vital to ditch, that is A, the commons or not, the externally given conditions for social life. They are that too, but not only that. That was sort of the classic sort of Marxist 19th century definition that saw the commons basically as this nature out there to be used, mobilized, appropriated, and so on, etc. The commons is a historical geographical construct. It is a socio-physical configuration. Water, for example, is not just H2O, it is a physical, social configuration that mobilizes, transforms, distributes, distributes H2O. That's the commons. So the commons for me refer fundamentally to the socio-ecological conditions and the collectively transformed, metabolized, to use Marx's terms, socio-ecological relations and configurations, such as water, air, climate, CO2, gene and other code, genetic and other codes, like information code, software code, etc., knowledge, information, as we've heard, learning, affective labors, the immaterial labors of care, of smile. When I walk into Starbucks, what do I see? A smiling body, a full body delivered to my full satisfaction in the delivery of an espresso on fair trade grounds. That's the mobilization of affective labors, the commons. Good teaching, good teaching, good teaching cannot be commodified yet. My university, neoliberal university, has been mobilized whatever it can to try to discipline my affective capacities to be, to the best of my ability to be a good teacher. Biodiversity, uh, yes, regimes, resources of all kinds, resources or not, they become. Coltan was just a piece of earth, now it's of course a prime resource that is in all our IT uh, 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 technologies and that of course nurtures the social ecological catastrophe that keeps on unfolding around the Great Lakes in Africa, which is the great reservoir of this rare earth called time. <coughs> Urban space is the classic form of a socially produced collective commons. Walk around in Dubiana and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So what is the arena of communism then? Well, the commons of socio-ecological arrangements of those that I've just exemplified and the power-laden regulatory conditions of the right of use, transformation, appropriation, access and distribution, the modalities of their geographical organization at the variety of geographical scales, not just the local, the national, the European, or the global, but all them in interrelated. And the, uh, and the configuration, access, ownership, distribution of produced socio-ecological configurations are the key domains around which the struggle over the commons unfolds. Who decides, who controls, who owns, who transforms, how is it distributed, for what and what purposes? So, to sum up now, in this introduction, there's a double concern with the commons. There's the articulation between the commons as a historical socio-ecological construct, on the one hand, and the process of being in common. That is the politically the process, which takes a variety of different forms, highly contested, of which communism is one of them. The commons is about non-yepropolitics. 
about non-profit in the struggle is precisely, as we know in the capitalism, about turning the commons into a commodity, irrespective of whether that's done by a public authority, like the state, or a private agent. That's why I would argue it's not any longer we can do with the state, because the state is also deeply ended old in a process of the privatization, the turning into private ownership of the collective uh, uh, common configurations. The democratic being in common, which is of course the domain of democratic socialism, concerns the mode of collective production and management of the common. I would argue that today, and at least since 2008, it has become abundantly clear that we are now living in properly socialist societies, politically speaking. That's why I insist on using the word communism rather than socialism. In February 2009, Newsweek, a weekly that cannot be accused of radical tendencies, put on the cover of its issue, uh, issue of 19 February, we are all socialists now. And I think that statement, that slogan, has to be taken absolutely seriously. That is, that the state, at a variety of geographical scales, operates today precisely as a socialist state. That is the mobilization of collective resources for the interest of an other collective, the collective of capital, the collective of the elites. Just to give you one number, about 2.5 trillion euro world has been appropriated from us in order to save the collective socialist interest of the capitalist elite in Europe and elsewhere. And, and, and elsewhere. So what we're doing, what we're seeing today is mobilizing the commons for the collective interest of the few in proper socialist ways, 20th century style, that is still the medium of the state. And then we should not forget something that I haven't heard yet, I haven't been here for, for the whole two, two days, but which, 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 which also pivots the commons of the earth to what should be our planned concern, which is the ecological nightmare, <coughs> and the commons of the earth, the commons of the earth. And what we do know now is that the physical commons of the earth, we make it. The climate, the temperature, rain, etc., we make together with the physical forces, and that should be taken seriously. That is what is meant by the notion of the Anthropocene introduced by Nobel Prize winning chemist Paul Kutzen in 2001, the Anthropocene as the idea that we're living in a new geological era in which the social, in articulation with the physical, produces the actual social physical configuration of the world that we inhabit. And that should be, of course, a main concern of any idea of communism for the 21st century. So let me say now a bit more about the commons as a historical geographical construct. And it's always very useful, of course, to remember, and, and some of the previous speakers did allude to that, to remember the historical geography of capitalism. And how, if you read Marx's economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844, he uh, distinguishes quite carefully between two forms of accumulation. On the one hand, what he calls mobile accumulation, that is the classic form of self-expansion of capital through the sequence of M, C, M plus. That is the mobilization of labor in the process of the transformation of nature and the private ownership arrangements, which propels the self-expansion of value and the accumulation of capital, which of course directly opposite to Capital as rent seeking. It's always amazing that we forget Capital Volume 2. And no one seems to read that. After Capital Volume 1, most I've done my best. That's all I can do. The Capital Volume 2, that is the mechanisms of distribution. Capital as rent seeking. And I would argue that the struggle over the commons is precisely the process of appropriation, production and appropriation of land, that is accumulation through the appropriation of fixed capital. Historically, 
in the 18th, 19th century when Malik was writing about it. Uh, it referred to the enclosures, we heard about that before. Enclosures as a monopoly for a nation that permitted an extraction. The appropriation of knowledge, collectively produced knowledges, technologies, sciences. And that often took place through processes of financialization. Don't forget that financialization is one of the key processes to the rich land is being appropriated. Think of the origin of the, fun, of the financial crisis today, toxic mortgages. It's about the urban process, the land seeking process of capital is extraction of land and its process of, uh, of financialization. You know, the old forms, they still exist and persist and continue. You know what, 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 what Marx called us, us prunkly, the accumulation, badly trans translated as primitive accumulation. The word by the word in relation to this procession. But on top of that, historically and over the past 20 years, a whole new range of a new commons have historically, geographically come about, over which a new, very intense, rent seeking capitalism has emerged. And I, 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 I want to quickly single out four. There's the privatization of environmental commons, like water, gene pools, our genetic pool, our genetic maker is a great collective commons. You know, it's not mine, it's an inheritance from the past, but it is clearly a big struggle over its commodification and privatization. Who owns your genes? Or those of others' species? Minerals, layer earths, Wastes, offsets, what some people have called, who well, are Ali had called it, accumulation by a pollution, <coughs> which is what the Kyoto Protocol is all about, accumulation by decarbonization. Intellectually, the property regimes and collective intellectual labor, we've heard another about that. Uh, um, Biogenetic and bioecological ownership, both internal, internal to the body, as well as bio diversity in regimes and configurations. And then finally, but not least, affective and cognitive labor. Affective labor of care, of love, of smile, of the philosophy that are being modified and closed in new times. And I think much of the new social class conflicts involve precisely around these. So I think that the key contradiction today, although the others of course still, still persist, is the commons versus then capital, then capital that becomes immediately financialized with just a short circuiting from land to financialization and, and plus sequence with all the speculative bubbles and crises that we've seen unfolding over the and this, of course, has to be put in the context of something that the left communist thought has ignored for too long and has left to those who believe that ecological concerns or the panacea for a new egalitarian way of being in common. That's why she's like not called the ecological concern, of course, is a new opium for the people. That does not mean, of course, that the commons of the earth should not be precisely the struggle over which communism unfolds today. What kind of physical environment do we produce? What kind of climate? Where and how do we want to manufacture? What kind of geological configurations are we going to permit or not permit? So I think around these, and concluding now, uh, uh, just two, two more minutes, I would argue that today's proto-political struggles that we've seen emerging over the past few years are precisely about <coughs> the appropriation distribution of land. So therefore, the key political struggles that embody a proto-communist sensitivity in their mobilization and the expression of their desire for something else are not articulated primarily around the capital labor axis, around the state, 
along the polity, in fact, these three are, by the new political movements, strongly rejected. New heterogeneous political subjects emerge. I'm interested in the question of who are the agents of emancipatory change? Who are the privileged subjects? We dwelt for too long in the proletariat as the privileged subject, and it was. And it still matters, don't misunderstand me, but a whole range of new political subjectivities arise precisely around these new forms of social conflict and struggle over which capitalist accumulation unfolds uh, uh, today. So you have women of all kind, men of all sorts, ages of all configurations that come together in these Pactinian festivals that in their practices already embody in a certain way the communist desire and stage it in their practices of alternative organization. So this is my last slide. So I think we have to rethink the relationship between the commons the role of the commons in today's process of capital accumulation, the political and social struggles unfolding over that, and the openings that offer in terms of political strategy if we want to be serious about <coughs> reviving the communist hypothesis in the 21st century, if you want to be really serious about that, which I'm not sure we are serious about, but that's a good struggle. That requires a number of things we urgently need to think as intellectuals. Yes, it's important to rethink past forms of comedy. There are extraordinary experiments that have gone on historically about how to live, how to be in common in a free, egalitarian, solidarity-based way. We have to give up on the state, the state as we knew it. The state today has become a post-democratic configuration of management of the givens whether you have a socialist government in Slovenia or a right-wing government. It matters on the, on the edges, but not in terms of the socialist transformation. It does not, and you all know that. So it announces the end of party, state, and proletarian, which then opens up who are the, the political subjects. How do we organize the complicated, difficult process of organization at a distance from the state and give up on the state as the privileged arena for conquest? and think about new geographical configurations for institutionalization of the communist hypothesis. It revolves around reclaiming a democratic commons, and what precisely a democratic commons is, is still a hotly uh, uh, debated theme. I'm not going to go into the uh, details. But it will revolve around mobilizing the new fault lines, the new axes of tension and struggle that mark contemporary capitalism, and which are basically situated around the question of the private versus the collective democratic management of the commons. So in other words, if you want to take the idea of communism for the 21st century seriously, we really have to consider the vexed question of political subject, forms of organization, and the arena. Thank you very much. So I'm opening a uh, debate now, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand and they might be answered. My colleagues in here just will answer the microphones. Actually, think is is, is uh, very important. 
but it has a problem uh, because uh, I think it makes sense uh, when we speak of enclosure of goods, public goods. But how then do you apply it uh, if, if you think about services? Services instead of goods. Uh, uh, and you, for example, in your de uh, definition, you also have care, which is not a public good. And how do you uh, extract rent uh, from a, from a uh, care service rather than uh, increasing surplus through work intensification? What I would argue is what, what's happening. Uh, and my third question is your critique of the state, uh, that we should give up the state, right? Uh, but do you then also mean, for example, in, in the British context, should we give up the NHS? Yes, very good. good questions. The first one is the, is the easy one. What is not common? Well, what is not common is all that is private. What I do with my love in my bathroom is not common. It's not. The food I cook at night that I have grown is actually not, but if I were to, that's not common. Um, but also on the non-personal side. The personal is private. It's not common. It's not common. My dreams, my desires, my fantasies are not common. My flat is not common. My car is not common. Same holds true, of course, on the side of capital. Right? Windows 8, or whatever it's called now, is not common. It is private. The atmosphere is common. Uh, now, the Division, the split between private and common, is not given. Not given by God, by nature, or by humans. It's politically contested. It's politically struggled over. For example, when I say that what I do in my bedroom with my private is private, it is. But if I were to do it with a child, it's not. But that's a political legal question. So the separation. Life in common is not fixed, given its historical, political struggle, over the contested, etc. But I find it very easy to, uh, to, to distinguish between the two. Of course, in the continuous production of new demarcation lines between what is private and common, and in the historical production of new forms of commons, like information, etc., opens precisely again uh, the terrain, the arena of deciding what is common and what is private. The privatization of software information is precisely about that. So that's my question to the first answer. The rent seeking, uh, uh, yes, rent as we know is, a, is an extraordinarily vexed problem in Marxist uh, thinking, and not just in Marxist thinking, most other economic thought does not even have the inkling of an answer to where this whole thing comes from. So I'm not going to argue that I have the answer, but I would want to insist that it's something that we have ignored at our peril, theoretical and political peril, and I would also insist, as I did, that today then seeking land extraction has become one of the key, not the only, but one of the key means of accumulation. In form of accumulation by dispossession, as far as we argue, is primarily about the population. Well, let, I, would, I was just trying to give an example. Let me give you two examples of, of what I mean by that. Neil Smith's infamous rent gap. That is the process of urban restructuring through which the private appropriation of rent gap within collectively produced urban config, configurations has been one of the hallmarks of urban capitalist development in the 1990s, 1920s. That's what I mean by rent seeking the attempts by capital to mobilize uh, the appropriation of the values potentially embedded in collective configurations like the urban. Another example is the current obsession among environmentalists for ecosystem services. The pain 
given to the commodification for non-use of biodiversity regimes because my biodiverse environments produce of all sorts of services that can be modified or not, but can, according to neoliberal logic, can have, have a price. Now these are not commodities in the standard sense, in the standard monetary sense of the world. Yeah, they have a price, but they're not commodities. Now this price is precisely what the flax rent. That, that, that's where I will do to seek it. Um, that would be my, 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 my answer to that. That example of services. Of services. Uh, care. I mean, care is one of the great commons, I think, including the National Health Service. Uh, um, now, in the proliferation of care and its privatization, the enclosure of care to the privatization of health care, care for elderly, etc., the mobilization of the affective uh, capacities, the affective capacities, and the possibility for you and I to care, to smile, to engage interpersonally is now an integral part of the process of commodification of care. It's a classic example of the collection of event. Um, so when I say that I want to give up on the state, let me be very precise here about what I mean. I give up on the state in the context of a political strategy of the realization of the communist hypothesis in the 21st century. I am not doing away with the state. The state is not going to wither away overnight. What I was insisting on, what I was insisting on is that today the state, irrespective of the political agent that occupied the state, certainly in the global north, there are exceptions elsewhere, has become the manager of what Badiou calls the capital of management, the capital of parliamentary order. order. That does not mean that this institutional configuration of management of capital, you know, the state as the exec executive, the class of bourgeoisie, is not worth fighting over. So fighting for the NHS is indeed a key concern. That's not the same as unfolding a socialist communist strategy <coughs> that centers on occupying the state as the terrain that needs to be occupied in order to realize the common hypothesis. Am I making sense? So we have to think about new institutional forms appropriate to our practices and which works at a distance from the given institutional configuration that we, give, that we, that we call the state. The state which is an institutional configuration of management today. Whether we consider the European Union, the European Union is a classic example here. It's a managerial configuration. And well, it matters, of course, who participates, who fights in it, and over what, etc. Yeah? But it's not any longer, perhaps never was, but certainly not any longer the, 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 the privileged geographical terrain, the political occupation in order to realize socialism and communism. That's what I want to say. Does it make sense? So I uh, make a distinction between strategy and the st thing that's still out there, and which of course be, 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 be fought over, just in the, in the same way as we would fight Exxon or private capital, we'd fight and struggle in order with the state. Okay, any more questions? Comments? Uh, question for Tommy, Eric, first for Tommy. Tommy, in national accounting, uh, uh, things are measured by outcomes when there's no monetary value. Either it's imputed monetary or it's measured in outcomes. So an example is you can measure literacy in outcomes or you can measure how well uh, pupils are performing in maths. So, for example, in, in PISA uh, research, which is problematic on so many counts. PISA. PISA, yeah. In so many counts, it's problematic. But, however, there's one interesting finding that if you go over $20,000 per pupil, there is no more. Uh, results are no better. So you have Norway with $70,000. We have average Europe 20,000. Results are the same. So that obviously shows that monetary value cannot always produce outcomes which are desirable. Uh, so I'm just wondering, in another one is for example, computer literacy is, a, is 
one of the things that they're trying to capture uh, uh, in satellite accounts. Do you think that although a free software has no obvious monetary value, that it can be accounted for and that we can't speak of it as it's produced value in your classical terms, no remarks terms? Have you come across any research or what are your thoughts on how do we represent, represent outcomes of use value of free software being widely spread in places where simply the object cannot afford or do not want to pay the cost of cost of reproduction. And I'm thinking about if you look at the reproduction of humans, if you want, as more capable beings through use value of software, you know, what is the outcome that we can measure? Maybe what I thought. And for Eric, Eric, you sound as if NHS was not built by the state. It was built by NIPE, and it was built by labor government at the Second World War. Uh, so was the housing, 30% of housing stock in 71 was owned by the state, distributed according to need list, to fill the form. Uh, so that's currently 50% of GDP spent by the state. Uh, at the time, we went from 2 3% 100 years ago to 50%. A large section of that money has been privatized, but still it's only 5% and it's been black lining for 20 years. No matter what Labour did, New Labour did the last 20 years, they actually didn't manage to uh, uh, eat more into the mass of uh, monetary value that the state is spending as final results. So I'm just wondering if uh, the, the socialist principle, as they call it at the time, I mean, they openly call the socialist if you read parliamentary records in the UK. And so what they said is distribution of health according to need and not according to ability of individuals to pay is a socialist principle. We will do so in housing, we will do so in health. Uh, these, these were astonishing results. So were in East Europe when we actually took over the state power for 40 years or 70 years. Uh, what would be the alternative? I mean, are we going to self organize? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it is so astonishing to hear you speak against the state that uh, I would like to hear what else would you do to create something like NHS for public housing or indeed what you could in East Europe to distribute it according to me. Hard to answer, but uh, maybe just a proviso. Uh, I think that uh, technological development is the result of, uh, of uh, capitalist development, and that technology is being developed in order to uh, uh, in order for capital to expand. Uh, so, in that sense, when you look at the history of free software, and it's becoming very quickly. Uh, anachronistic or never cutting it uh, in being able to measure with with the level of uh, technological um, uh, sophistication of, of uh, other operating systems. Uh, I think that uh, it throws up a question of what would be uh, another way to think of technological development, uh, one that wouldn't uh, be uh, strictly subsumed to, to uh, capitalist development. And that is, a, of course, a utopian question. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as of value, it's, it's in a way easy to measure what the value of free software is for uh, Googles of this world or Amazons of this world because uh, it's, it's a free input. Uh, most of the data centers nowadays uh, run on uh, customized Linux uh, operating systems. Kindle runs on Linux, etc., etc. So, it, in that sense, uh, it is not disruptive. It was thought, uh, or it was designed initially by uh, Richard Stallman, uh, regardless of his explanation what it should do. Um, so. Yeah, it's hard to say. In that sense, people tend to use what's at the highest level of technological development and not what is failing to, uh, to uh, mobilize uh, producers, programmers to, to create what, something that could compete. Uh, though on desktop, I mean, Linux can compete with uh, Windows and it's, it's uh, very similar. But yeah, I think it's very difficult in terms of uh, doing metrics, uh, probably we could look at uh, how big is the service economy around uh, free software, how big is uh, its part as, as uh, input 
in, into uh, capitalist enterprise and then a social value um, I don't know you should tell us that I guess you, you know better than I do <laughs> first of all yet again I was not making an argument against state organization of all manner of services in, including health services. I was arguing against considering as a socialist emancipatory strategy today the occupation of the state as the ultimate objective. That is what I was critiquing. Now, let, let me come to, 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 to answering your question. It's absolutely right that the extraordinary struggles in the 20th century produced precisely the configuration that you were alluding to, that in Europe 50% of gross product is controlled by the state. Of course, an increasing part of that socialized product is being distributed to the elites, both by nominally socialist governments as well as by conservative governments. I look at what Labour did, New Labour did, in terms of the distributing uh, public uh, state resources to the elites. It's extraordinary, it's reflected, of course, in these uh, data of increasing inequality, etc. That's not only the case in the UK, that's the case elsewhere, too. Secondly, even to the extent that Take the example of the National Health Service um, um, in the UK, which has now become de facto a health service for the poor, because the elite can and do systematically opt out of the state run state owned national health service through a private scheme. Right? So this is health service for the poor, which is now fundamentally run as a, a, a commodified competitive uh, uh, neoliberal outfit. I've been living in the UK for know, 26 years. I don't want to touch National Health Service by a barge call if I can avoid, if I can avoid it. I, I thanks to my cosmopolitan uh, 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 citizenship, I go to Belgium and have my health care there because the their state O2 is still better organized than in the UK. So the reappropriation of the National Health Service for all in the interest of all would be indeed a key uh, task to do. On the other side of the equation is that even if, even if, and this is one of the great challenges, of course, even if a left uh, strategy manages to occupy the state apparatus, the disciplining forces from outside are so devastating that there's very little that can be done. Think of think of Pasok <coughs> in Greece two years ago. Pop on the for which I have no great respect, except for the moment that he said, let the people decide the referendum. Yeah? He was out three days later. Right? So there is not enough room to maneuver, no, without a left European strategy, which is, for example, about occupy, occupying the European territoriality around the European Union, which is not a country, which is not a state. What is the European Union? A state? Well, it's not in the kind of the classic 19th century form. We really have to think through what is the territoriality of the geographical scales we need and have to occupy. This has nothing to do with whether it should be state-owned or state ordinary, although that's important to, to fight over. We just, a, just a brief response, please. The total volume of services and goods delivered by the private health sector in the UK is in single digits. And is in single digits. I don't know the number, but it's less than 10%. I'm really happy to be with 90% of the poor. Um, we ran out of time, sorry, Tony. Maybe there's an urgent short question for one of the other speakers, so we don't just monopolize, but short means short. Not to, uh, there is, uh, yeah, well, I will be short. I mean, I, I still don't understand the argument about rent. If I'm the only one in the audience, then I apologize. But rent seeking is a term that has a very particular meaning and resonance in bourgeois economics, where it's used generally 
against any form of state or public uh, involvement. Uh, whereas rent, in Marx, as I understand it, complicated debates, but rent is a deduction from total surplus value or total value in circulation. And so I'm not quite clear about how you're using it here. I'm not saying it's wrong. But the other thing that struck me in your last slide, you had private versus collective. Now, surely it should be private versus public, individual versus collective. And I think the examples you gave show that the real sort of opposition you're drawing is between collective and individual, because Andrew Kleiman, for example, explained that they can, public property can be, in a sense, uh, you know, commodity-based and so on. So I think that distinction perhaps would clarify your argument. Uh, no, this was, this choice of vocabulary was done for purpose. Uh, deliberately. Common ownership is not about property. The struggle that owns precisely that common things can be owned, used, but cannot be a property and are not in contrast to. And that's why I put public as state or collective and related <coughs> in the same category of property. Not that it doesn't matter whether it is collectively um, that is by the state for the time. Which is not the people as we know. Um, versus common, which is about non property It's that distinction that I'm interested in and is important to find out. On rent, very, very briefly, of course, the rent is fundamentally a distribution. It's a distribution thing. But what is ignored is the production of the level of rent, the thorny issue in Marxist political economy about a, a monopoly rent, absolute rent, differential rent, one differential rent, two. What I agree with, 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 with you that rent is a distribution category, that's what Marx would do. But that stands in a complicated relationship, something that we have very little to say about these days, about the level, how much it is which Marx discusses at length, although he doesn't solve the issue, right, to this complicated theorization of monopoly and absolute land, differential land one, differential land two. Of course, they, they, get, they get fused together in bourgeois notions of uh, land. And the whole argument of the common is precisely about the configuring of absolute differential land one, differential land two, and its both production and subsequent uh, appropriation to the distribution. That's the, it's not just distribution of capital in market. It's also a question about how much is it? And where does it come from? Where does it come from? And we're particularly interested in the question of differential land one, which Marx uh, identified as, the, as a free gift of nature. As a geographer, I dismiss the notion, the notion of nature as a given. Nature for me is a social, material, historically a product. So differential land one does not reside in nature, but resides in the historical, social, ecological construction. Like in resources, oil fields, for example, but holds true for a software code too, uh, for example. And that is something you've nothing to say about these days, the theoretically. And how, nonetheless, much of the actual social struggle today revolves precisely about both the production of these rents, who produces them, and who appropriates them subsequently. And it's a bad one. Okay, now we're really behind schedule, so I have to conclude. Uh, I would like to thank all three speakers again, and we will reconvene shortly after, after the coffee break with the panel on primitive accumulation and post-socialist uh, transition, so you're all welcome to join us again.